Журналисты. Добрый день, уважаемые участники сегодняшней пресс-конференции, журналисты, дамы и господа, президент Анаки Пресска всегда рад видеть вас и разрешите дать слово модератору сегодняшней пресс-конференции, господину Ришарду Халенде, региональному представителю УВКПЧ ООН. Пожалуйста, господин Халенде, вам слово. Спасибо большое. Я, я очень рад вас приветствовать здесь, на этой пресс-конференции. Сегодня, сегодня, сегодня у нас есть гость, спецдокладчик по экстремальной бедности и прав, правам человека, господин Оливье Дешутер. И он представит сегодня приблизительно ну, не отчет, а то, что после его визиты в Киргизстане он видел и услышал от своих партнеров. Конференция передается в прямом эфире в английском языке. И у нас есть перевод на русский язык, чтобы у вас есть наушники. Мы пригласим вас задавать вопросы после отчета и заявления господа Шутера. И как у вас есть желание сделать интервью индивидуально, то, пожалуйста, подходите к коллегам и попросите, как это сделать. Но через несколько минут мы тоже привезем напечатанный пресс-релиз после визиты, что вы получите его на английском, ну, на, на английском, русском и киргизском языке. И тоже, как вы хотите посмотреть ну, оригиналы этих документов, они будут размещены на, на веб-сайте спецдокладчика, и там тоже будут эти запись, видеозапись этой конференции и фотографии из визита. То есть какие-то вопросы? Все понятно, да? Хорошо, это можно разобрать. So we are ready, Mr. Olivier Schulter, to follow the service. Well, thank you very much to Mr. Richard Komenda for his introductory remarks. I'm very pleased to be here. And I look forward to the conversation that will follow my, my initial presentation. It is very striking that the um, gender pay gap is 75%, the result both of lower hourly wages for women and of the fact that women, more than men, work part-time. So that is the challenge we face. And in order to face that challenge, we need to address the key issues that I was told about and that I could look into um, in the course of my visit. The first topic I would like to address is that of corruption. The perception of corruption is very high in this country. One um, survey um, indicated that 92% uh, of those polled in this survey saw corruption as a big or very big problem in the country. And many people I spoke to told me they had occasionally had to pay a small sum to the doctor to be treated, to the school director to have the kid registered in schools, or to the social worker in order to be uh, listed as a beneficiary of some social program. This is a regressive tax on the poor. People in poverty may face obstacles in having access to certain public services as a result of those facilitation payments being expected. Parents may be unable to send their kids to school if they fear stigma, if they do not contribute to the repairs in the school, and people may renounce being treated in healthcare centers 
if they have to pay the small fee. Uh, just uh, recently, on 31st of May, the government announced a new anti-corruption strategy for 2022-2024, based primarily on digitalization of public services to remove the human element, the discretionary power of public officials, and ensure that access to social protection and public services will be more automatic. This is, in theory, a good idea. But of course, many families in poverty have no access to internet, have no or weak digital literacy. So they should be supported in being able to use online forms and to register in systems um, using the internet. Otherwise, this will be a new source of exclusion. A second topic I looked at is education. Kyrgyzstan is highly respected and uh, renowned for investing a lot in education. It, in, it, it uh, dedicates, according to the latest figures, um, up to 7% of the GDP in the educational system. We were told that, that 60 billion songs went to education uh, in uh, 2022, but that is not the whole story. In recent years, we have seen uh, studies, not least from the, the, the PISA, the Program for International Student Assessment, showing that the quality of education provided is very poor. Many schools are poorly equipped. In fact, 179 schools need to be demolished and rebuilt because the buildings are so worn out. And many um, uh, schools do not have the sanitation facilities that um, uh, would um, normally be expected. One problem I looked at in greater detail is the question of preschool education. It is very striking that 78% of children do not have access to preschool and that is a serious problem because children um, in poor families will be disadvantaged even more as a result of not being well prepared when they enter formal education. So more efforts should be done despite the important budget already dedicated to education in the country. Turning now to healthcare, the major problem I have witnessed in the healthcare sector is, uh, apart from the small facilitation payments I've already mentioned, the out-pocket payments that can be problematic for certain, certain groups of the population. Of course, as you know, the state guaranteed benefit package provides that 28 categories of patients um, do not have to contribute to the cost of healthcare. Those 20, 28 categories include military personnel, um, um, orphans, children below five years of age, people with disabilities, and so forth. But that does not cover all people who are poor. And so many poor families still have to contribute to receive the health care they deserve. And they also face high costs of medicines, although some medicines are almost fully free um, for treatment of cancer, epilepsy, schizophrenia, for example. This does not cover, for example, um, medicine against hypertension. I also examined the question of housing. And here, we have seen efforts done by the government to improve access to housing for the population under the affordable housing strategy 2015-2020. And now, under the My Home strategy, Moi Dom, 2021-2026. Those programs seek to provide loans at preferential interest rates for households seeking to buy their house. 
But these programs are of little use to people who do not have stable regular incomes and cannot pay back a loan even at those preferential interest rates. There are limited social housing programs, but the queues are extremely long. People have to wait 15 to 20 years in order to be able to enroll. And so I very much support the proposal by civil society groups to adopt a new law on social housing to increase um, access or improve access to housing for families in need. I also believe the regulatory framework to protect people from evictions should be improved consistent with international human rights law. Let me say next a few words about employment. Every year, some 350,000 young adults leave high school, leave the university, and seek work. And the economy is not creating enough jobs for all, so a large number of them, between 7,000 and 50,000, depending on the sources, migrate to other countries, primarily Russia, but also Kazakhstan, Turkey, and increasingly South Korea, the UK, and Japan. That is extremely problematic. Youth unemployment rate uh, reaches 14.8%. That is a figure from 2020. In other terms, it is more than double the average unemployment rate um, in the country. Women are particularly affected. The employment rate of women is much lower than that of men. I already mentioned the figures. And what is more troubling even is that um, if you look at the young people who are not in education, employment, or training, in other terms, that are neither um, trained nor employed, the figure is 29% amongst girls and only 12.1% amongst boys, which shows that for young women graduating from high school or university, the prospects are very dim indeed. We also know that in this country, 71% of the workers are informal workers. And as a result, they are not protected or very weakly protected by labor legislation, by social uh, protection schemes. And in the future, they will not be protected by the old age pension system that is in place. So the formalization of work is another important priority that should be taken into account. And I very much welcome the fact that in the plans to reform pensions that I discussed at length with the social fund during my visit, formalization of work is one of the key priorities. Let me say a few words about remittances, because this is, of course, a huge issue in this country. And let me be very clear about the dilemma that the government is facing. In the short term, remittances are a very powerful tool to reduce poverty. They are a vital safety net, particularly for poor households in rural areas that benefit more than richer households from the system. In fact, it is a vital safety net without which poverty figures would be significantly higher. So, unsurprisingly, the government seeks to promote migration of young workers to countries such as the UK, Japan, South Korea, and increasingly Germany and other countries. However, this is not a long-term solution for the country. A country cannot thrive by making young workers its main export commodity. These are young people in which the country has invested. They are not in the country to contribute to social protection. They are not in the country to, con to pay taxes. They are not in the country to start businesses. 
and money back to the country, but that money essentially serves uh, to uh, meet consumption needs, not to invest so that the economy can grow. Moreover, many children suffer the impacts of this large migration. 99,000 children in the country have their both parents abroad, and these children are at risk. They are left with the family, they are left with the neighbors, the risks of ill treatment, violence against children, but also neglect of children and poor academic performance as a result, these risks are very important. So I think gradually there is no other option for the country than to create more local opportunities for these young adults so that they have reasons to stay and fewer reasons to leave. I'd like to close with the issue of social assistance and social protection more broadly. There is uh, an important program that we studied very carefully, the Uybolok Komek program, uh, which is providing cash transfers to families that are below a level of income of 1,000 soms per month per member of the household. And those families receive 1,215 soms per month per child below 16 years of age. It's an important program. I met many people who benefit from this program, and for them, that support is important. In total, 330,000 children are covered. But there is one major problem, which is that the program is complex to administer. Assessing who qualifies may be difficult for social workers, and there is room for corruption as a result. The coverage is significantly below the number of families that normally would be eligible under the program because it is a very complex procedure to collect the documents to prove your income and to go through the different hurdles that um, the families encounter. So in 2017, the Parliament had chosen a formula that would have been much more simple to administer. A system of universal child benefits that would protect all children, um, whatever the level of income of the family, but especially families with three children of more or more, and that is much easier to administer. It can be uh, much more popular politically, and it is a system that would benefit particularly families in poverty because it is large families that are more frequently facing poverty rather than families with fewer children. Of course, Uybolok Komok is not the only program in place. I also examined the monthly social benefits provided to um, orphan children, uh, people with disabilities, um, or other vulnerable categories. Again, this provides an essential safety net. But I heard many testimonies of people who said they had to pay the social worker usually the equivalent of one month of the benefits they claim in order to have access to the program. So there is room for progress in this area too. 
Finally, there is a pensions system that I studied. It's a, it's a system that is covering a very large number of old age persons. It's quasi-universal because in the former Soviet era, almost everyone was employed. But in the future, all the workers who today are informal workers will not be covered by that old age pension system. And the pension they will have a right to will be very minimal indeed. So this is one more reason to accelerate formalization. And this is the main challenge that in the future the ability for the pension system to protect the population will, will meet. So these are my, my key messages, and uh, I have shared these messages with the government this morning. I will continue to uh, cooperate with the government uh, with a view to presenting a final report in Geneva at the Human Rights Council in June 2023. So the government has one year to take into account those messages, to launch reforms in the key areas I've identified. I list in my statement that will be distributed to you very soon the five short-term priorities that I believe can be launched within this year. And I also identify some more long-term objectives the government should set for itself. I strongly believe that the government has no choice. Uh, today the economy is weakly diversified. Uh, revenues essentially depend on the extractive industry, tourism, 5% of the GDP, and remittances from migrant workers abroad. But that is not viable in the long term. Uh, the economy must diversify into manufacturing and services sectors. Many more opportunities should be provided for young workers. The tax base should be increased by formalizing work. And that is how social protection can be financed. Ultimately, it is by investing in people, by investing more in social protection, by improving schools, by fighting against corruption in the healthcare system, that young Kyrgyz adults will be encouraged to stay and to contribute to the future prosperity of the country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. De Schutter. The spot is uh, interesting uh, um, summary of pre preliminary findings. Сейчас какие есть вопросы, ответы, пожалуйста. Да, давайте. Our interpreter cannot hear the question. So, which, which, which officials we, you met during your meeting? So, да. Да. Yes, what, what, thank you. If you can elaborate on the list of thank, the people thank you, you thank you, Thank you for your question. It is a very long list. I met officials from eight ministries in Bishkek, but I also went to Narin, to Osh, to Bakhten, traveled um, in uh, the south uh, to meet with local officials there. Um, I also met with the uh, ombudsperson, Atir Abdrakhmatova. I had a very interesting discussion with Gulnara Jumataeva, the vice chair of the social fund. I spoke to the 
um, deputy chair of the Supreme Court. Um, I, I met with um, members of various administrations in the ministries uh, with whom I had a dialogue. So unfortunately, the food list is too long for me to read out, but it is publicly available. Um, I believe that in the press release, there is a, a link uh, to the program of the visit where you have an idea of the officials whom I met. Można podejść k mikrofonu zdjęć, żeby pierwotnik słyszał. I pożałosta przedstawcie siebie. Thank you. In all countries, this is a real challenge to measure poverty exactly. And I am more interested, therefore, in uh, how the, 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 the curves evolve than in absolute figures. Of course, Kyrgyzstan has a national poverty line. Uh, that is set at 1,000 psalms per month per person. And this poverty line in par parity of purchasing power is equivalent to about 4.2 US dollars per day, which is um, what a lower middle income country such as Kyrgyzstan must use as a national poverty line. Um, and, and according to that poverty line, in 2020, 25.3% of the population was in poverty. But the recent crisis, uh, particularly the result of imported food inflation, since Kyrgyzstan imports most of its wheat, its sugar, and its vegetable oils, and the reduced remittances resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic and from the crisis resulting from the invasion of Ukraine, all this allows us to anticipate a significant increase of the figures, which I hope will not materialize, and which I hope, if it does materialize, will be temporary. I think what's important for us is to realize that without remittances, many families would not be able to cope. And that is a very fragile um, answer to the question of poverty. It is also not one that in the long term is sustainable for the country. And that is why in complete agreement with uh, many people I spoke to in the country, I believe the country should invest more not in encouraging migration, but in encouraging people to invest here, creating more opportunities for the young adults of this country. Thank you very much. Спасибо большое. Есть вопросы? Следующие. Здравствуйте, меня зовут Ирина Григорьевна, я из Россия, я хочу задать вопрос. Вот сегодня на фоне роста глобального напряжения в мире, конфликтов в Украине, растут цены, и в том числе сейчас я максимум всего, что в жизни, где многие вообще выражают на себя 70%. И вот есть также ФАО ООН, это возрастная организация, которая предложила выезжать. В рамках своего визита может быть провести какую-то работу или может быть дать большой анализ того, как в Казахстане могут быть. Думаю, что это общая стабильность, и 
Хотел задать второй вопрос по поводу диверсификации экономики. Как лучше как раз нам сегодня проводить в этих условиях? Спасибо. So thank you for these questions. Uh, I am as worried as everyone else uh, by the rising prices on global markets for major agricultural commodities. And in Kyrgyzstan, there are reasons uh, to fear this increase. Uh, Kyrgyzstan imports 47% of its wheat, 37% of its sugar, 84% of its vegetable oil. And as you know, Ukraine and Russia provide 25% of the world's exports of wheat, 15% of the world's export of maize, and Ukraine is the most important exporter of sunflower oil. So that dependency of Kyrgyzstan on imports and the um, closer of certain supply chains from Ukraine and Russia are indeed a source of concern. I think, however, that the rise of prices on global markets is not attributable to scarcity. It's not that we have too little. In fact, the food stocks are um, quite high in many countries and and the harvests in Ukraine were not as bad as was feared. A significant part of the explanation of high food prices that has to do with this speculation, as well as uh, high energy prices, oil, gas, have been increasing since 2021, leading fertilizers to be more expensive and leading the costs of food production to rise significantly. So um, I hope um, markets will um, stop panicking and for this transparent information about the levels of stocks available is what we need. In the long term, I believe uh, Kyrgyzstan should question um, this dependence on imports, rebuild some measure of self-sufficiency, of course, it is not realistic to expect Kyrgyzstan to satisfy its own needs in terms of food production. But um, um, it should diversify its, its imports and, and it should um, produce more for itself. Um, however, the support going to farmers is uh, relatively minimal. I met many rural households who, although benefiting from some form of support from the state, particularly um, in the form of uh, Wiboloko Komok, were telling me they want animals, they want land, they want productive assets in order to increase production. But yes, the situation is serious and, you know, many families spend 70, 75 percent of their income on on food, so when you have an increase of 30-40% of food prices, it is a very serious problem for families. And when you ask people what made them most worried, it is that that they referred to. On your second question about diversifying the economy, I am no magician. But I can read the figures. And I see that the economy is primarily focused on minerals extraction, including gold, on tourism, and on sending workers abroad to receive their remittances. That is not viable. And that is not labor intensive in terms of local production. So my recommendation to the government is simply that education should be improved to encourage um, people to start businesses, to create a, a, a manufacturing industry that can recruit people, 
um, as well as the services industry, which requires a highly qualified workforce. But such industries cannot flourish here because people are too poor. So you must at the same time reduce poverty, support low income households to improve uh, their situation and have a higher purchasing power. No one will produce here if there is no one to sell to. Thank you. Thank you. Пожалуйста, можете. Ваши исследования показали то, что уровень жизни в Кыргызстане в плачевном состоянии. И скажите, легко ли было, бы, было вам получать такие данные от госпожных? И второй вопрос. Статистические данные не всегда сражают полную картину. Как вы считаете, в, реалии, в наших реалиях уровень жизни еще ниже? Well, I, I, I benefited from a very, I think, uh, good cooperation from the government. I met with whom I wanted to meet. I was provided the figures I asked for. Um, there is, frankly, broad agreement on the diagnosis I propose. But there is, I think, um, a tension between the short term and the long term. For this government, what is the short term? It is a public debt that was 68% in 2020. That now is a bit lower, but that makes it difficult for the government to borrow. The short term is um, poverty figures that would be much higher without remittances. And so the government negotiates with countries to favor the export of workers. And the short term is institutions that uh, tell the government it should not be too generous with the population, because otherwise the situation of um, its uh, budget will worsen. But I look at the long term, and I wonder whether these short term responses and strategies are viable. And my answer is that they are not. And so the challenge is to have a multi-year approach so that we don't remain locked in the short term and can plan the future. Human rights can guide us in this respect. The right to education, the right to health, the right to social security, and the right to work are all important human rights that can put the government on the path to a much more sustainable development. Um, as regards data, which is really at the heart of your question, um, um, uh, they, they exist, these data. I met with the National Statistical Committee that I think is a very professional body. But data are not what politicians necessarily act upon. And what we need is these data to be considered as a source of monitoring so that progress towards SDGs is much more carefully tracked. Many people here would not survive, I should, I should add, without solidarity of the neighbors, of the extended family, of the networks. That is a safety net the government is not responsible for, but it plays also a very important role. So we have very high poverty figures, but families are protected from destitution thanks to this solidarity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Пожалуйста, можете подойти к микрофону. Добрый день. Меня зовут Айдай Кадырова. Я являюсь директором общественного предварительного Microphone is off. Thank you. Добрый день. Меня зовут Айдай Кадырова. Я являюсь директором общественного предварительного фонда «Бабушка Адрушина». Спасибо большое за то, что вы нашли время, ну, как сказать, по 
помочь нам, нашей стране, искоренить уровень бедности. И у меня к вам такой вопрос, вот как к докладчику, как к эксперту. У нас вот в стране внедряется система государственного социального заказа. То есть многие министерства начали вводить вот эту систему. И первым государственный социальный заказ реализуется с 2008 года Министерство труда и социального развития. У меня такой вопрос. Допустим, через развитие вот, системы госсоцзаказа, через развитие социального государственно-частного партнерства, насколько возможно было бы решить проблемы бедности в стране? Потому что, вы же понимаете, через систему госсоцзаказа, допустим, реализуются социальные проекты, в результате чего, допустим, люди получают какие-то услуги, те, которые работают в гражданском обществе, ну, в организациях, платят налоги. Вот. И, ну, в общем, это со всех сторон выгодно. И насколько, если мы будем продолжать развивать вот, систему госсоцзаказа и государственного частного предпринимательства, можно решать социальные проблемы страны и вообще развитие страны в общем. Спасибо. Uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm going to have to disappoint you, um, and I regret this, because I, I, I know um, and respect the work of Babushka for adoption. Thank you for being here. But I disappoint you because on the social contract project, we are still at a very experimental stage. It involves a very small number of families today, families um, who um, I have not been able to speak to. What I heard is that the program was under evaluation and that based on whether the experimentation is considered successful or not, it will be expanded or not. Um, but the idea is to create productive activity, opportunities for formal employment, and um, that is, I think, in general, uh, a, a good idea. But I can't say more because I haven't studied this in greater detail. Спасибо большое. Я думаю, что может быть нашему правительству стоит поработать в этом направлении, потому что с одной стороны, видите, если через систему ГСД, да, госсоцзаказа, потом через систему развития государственного частного партнерства, это рабочие места, то есть это развитие сферы услуг, это оплата налогов, это решение социальных проблем. Я вот не знаю, как это обстоит в других странах, но примерно, если Крымстан тоже работать начнет в этом направлении, я думаю, что было бы очень здорово. Спасибо. Спасибо большое, коллеги. Еще есть вопросы? Пожалуйста, подходите. Добрый день, меня зовут. Слышно? Да. Добрый день, меня зовут Ильбар Чайкас. А у меня вопрос. Я не знаю, что вы только комментируете. Well, I wouldn't say only, because the South is a very large area. Um, but I went in, in, in Narin, in Osh, and in Bakten. I also spent some time in um, uh, Nunkat. Um, so, yes, I did not travel to the North. Uh, that is correct. Well, um, the reason I chose those oblasts that I mentioned is because it is there that the um, poverty figures are worst. Uh, Jalalabad and, and Narin um, um, are relatively better off, but, um, uh, sorry, are, are, are the worst regions, and, and, and Osh, Bishkek, much better off. In general, uh, rural areas are much uh, more poor than, than cities, um, that explains why Wibuloko Komok covers mostly rural households. Um, so there is still this gap. The gap is narrowing, however, 
and I saw many families who had one or more members migrating to the cities. And so around Bishkek, we now have, depending on how many you count, maybe 48, 50 Novostroiki settlements, often composed of people having migrated from rural areas and sometimes very poorly served by public services, very poorly equipped. So although rightly there is a focus on rural areas and on the poor oblasts of Jalalabad and Narin, um, as well as Bakten, um, it's important to realize that there is a new class of urban poor that, that also deserves to be paid attention to. Yeah. I, I think this is an important question, um, which, however, I did not have an opportunity to, to study in, um, in detail. It is not something I discussed um, with the Ministry of Finance, um, although I did discuss the budgetary priorities, I did not discuss decision making. In the end of mission statement that will be distributed to you very shortly, it's now, um, I think, uh, it is there, it is available. You will see some references to that question of monitoring of the use of public funds. And I know that within the health sector, there's been a, um, a recent development that raises this question. So I would, I would refer you back to my statement on this point. Jest jeszcze dopełnitelne wapracy. Tak nie to. So there no additional question. Maybe you'll you'll give follow up and summary of your of your visit and your you know what's the next steps. Thank you very much indeed. So I would like to 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 thank you all for being here. You will have many, uh, much more information in the end of mission statement that is being distributed uh, by my team uh, and that is now available in, in the Kyrgyz language. Um, I have to say, I've been very impressed by the cooperation I obtained from the government. Uh, governments are not obliged to accept such visits as mine. They voluntarily do this as a gesture of goodwill towards the international community and towards the UN human rights system in particular. So I would like to express my gratitude for having allowed this visit to take place and having shared um, all this information with me. I also benefited tremendously from the civil society groups and experts whom I could consult with before the visit and during the visit. And I would like to express my gratitude to my team. I'm supported by superb, dedicated individuals who for weeks before the visit spoke to people here, interviewed experts, collected data, commissioned research, allowing me to enter in the country with a, a very good quality information allowing me to raise the right questions. I would like to mention by name Patricia Varela from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and Agat Osinski, my personal advisor. I also benefited from the excellent support that Richard Comenda, you provided. Richard is, uh, until today, and still will be tomorrow the head of the regional office for Central Asia of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. But I think he now has become a friend. 
And I would like to thank you very much again for your support. Um, the mission was easy and fun, thanks to the support of Richard and his team, with Bakai and Oksana, who have been so helpful. So with this, let me uh, close this, uh, this press conference. And um, again, let me alert you to the statement that is now available in Kyrgyz language. Um, and I wish you uh, a very good weekend. Thank you. Спасибо большое. Да, все, спасибо. Спасибо вам за содержательную презентацию. Thank you.